Well, good morning, Chalmers Community Church family and friends. May our prayer be as the ladies have sung, that the Lord would spur us on to build our lives on his love, that he would be our firm foundation, that our trust would be in our Lord Jesus Christ alone, and that our trust, having been placed in him, would cause us to never be shaken. What a great thing to begin our service with today. Let's pray. Father God, we echo the words of that song. We really, truly do. You are worthy of all praise and glory. There is indeed none like you. So Lord, we choose to build our lives on you. We choose to pattern our ways after your ways. We choose to submit to your will and trust you for every step for all of our days. Thank you, God, for your abundant blessings. Thank you for your perfect timing. Thank you for the forgiveness and for the peace that comes from you. Lord God, we give you thanks for working in our province to begin the loosening of restrictions due to COVID. Thank you for your working that way. Would you continue to work to draw us to the end of this pandemic? And Lord, give us patience still in the meantime. Father, would you be the shelter for those who feel lost and alone today? Would you be the hug for those who need your touch? Lord Jesus, would you be the shepherd for those who need a reminder today that we do not wander without a guide? Would you be the savior for those who need rescue today? And help us, we pray, Heavenly Father, to get a deeper glimpse of you, and in that deeper glimpse of you to fall even in, more in love with you today. This we pray in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Chalmers family and friends, uh, for coming together in this online way today yet again. Pastor Bruce Jones here with you, and this is a happy time because this today, right now, it's our last online-only service here at Chalmers. Next week, which is February the 28th, we will resume our in-person services at 10 a.m. at the Chalmers Community Church building on the 7th concession east of Highway 21, just north of Kincardine and south of Tiverton. So uh, if you've perhaps uh, started um, your relationship with Chalmers, even through some of these um, uh, online services, uh, we would encourage you to come on out and be part of our church family and visit and come with us next Sunday, the 28th. Uh, now, we realize, though, that not everybody is going to be comfortable to meet again in person in public by next Sunday, and there are many people whose health will make that a little bit difficult as well. Not to mention the difficult winter weather that tends to happen around this time of year, some uh, like we've had lately. Uh, we also realize that some folks have been listening and watching from some distance away. So what we will do is we're going to continue to post sermons, the messages like this, onto YouTube as we've done over the last couple of months. And we'll continue to do that for the next while. I will continue to record my sermon in the latter part of each week, and Katie uh, will send out the YouTube link each Sunday morning, basically around uh, the same time as uh, the church service is happening. So the sermon will be the same, both online and in person, but the online services will not have as many other elements uh, with them, at least for now. But even having said that, we will be blessed over the next couple of Sundays, we trust, in our online services by a couple of more songs from Laura Pashier and Lori Convey and Olivia Convey and Heather Vanderlip, uh, the same ladies who sang Pat Barrett's song, Build My Life Today. So I want to thank you again, ladies, for leading us to worship Jesus so beautifully in that song this morning. That, uh, appreciate that so very much. So, in-person services begin again next Sunday, 10 a.m., but online messages on YouTube will continue for the next while at least. Now, you may wonder what to expect when you come back to in-person in services, and uh, for just about all of us, this is something that we have experienced once already. Uh, this isn't the first time we've gone from lockdown back to in-person services. That happened just about everywhere back last summer and fall. So this regathering will look much the same as that. And if you experienced it last time, um, you know, it'll probably even be easier to experience it uh, this time. But for the sake of good communication, I want to encourage you, first of all, to prepare to wear a mask while inside the building, just the same way as if you would be going to the grocery store or something. Those masks look like they will be part of our lives for some time yet. Um, you should also know that there is no particular prohibition against singing um, in our service, but everybody in attendance uh, will need to sing with your mask on, except those few uh, singing leaders at the front during uh, uh, leading worship. They can have their mask off for the time that they're leading worship. 
Um, but each worship leader is going to be able to choose how they want to put the service together, depending upon their own level of comfort with regard to singing at this point right now. Uh, some of them may choose to sing as normal, and some of them may choose to use other creative ways to express worship for the next few weeks or even the next few months. That would be, you know, testimonies, extended scripture readings, online or recorded songs, uh, dramatic readings, that kind of thing. Whatever other things they, they may feel more comfortable with if they would prefer to not sing as much. That's totally up to each individual worship leader to decide. Now, each family and or individual will be signed in upon arrival, and that is for contact tracing. Uh, each person will be asked to use hand san sanitizer upon entering, not the smallest of children, but each of the youth and adults will be asked to use hand sanitizer. And uh, high touch surfaces will be cleaned regularly, no problem. The two meter physical distancing whenever possible kind of guidelines will remain in place also for the time being as well. And so as I said in last Wednesday's devotional email, alas, that means that hugs will be kind of discouraged at this point, but let me tell you, physical displays of affection will be encouraged again someday. I'm the kind of a person I show my a lot of my love through physical touch, through handshakes and arms around the shoulder and hugs and that kind of thing. And I just can't wait to be able to do that again, but uh, we kind of have to hold off on that again for just a little while longer. Now, as always, too, if you're not feeling well, the encouragement is stay home, right? Even if you want to come, if you're not feeling well, you need to stay at home and get feeling better, right? So as I said, the online messages are going to continue for the immediate future with YouTube links sent out each Sunday morning as we've done since the beginning of January for those who aren't yet comfortable to meet in person or whose health is not stable enough to return or for those who live too far away. But one other thing I want to say about that, if you would like your name to be added to our email list, I would encourage you to send an email to our church administrator, uh, at Katie, at info at chalmerschurch.com. Info at Chalmers Church, and Chalmers is C-H-A-L-M-E-R-S. Info at ChalmersChurch.com, and Katie will add you to our email list, and you will have that stuff, the links, sent out to you on Sunday morning. Let me encourage you as well that donations to the Chalmers ministry can still be sent through e-transfer, also to, to Katie at info at ChalmersChurch.com. We will have the opportunity for you to give an offering, of course, in... in um, our uh, in, on uh, in our in-person services again i would encourage you to remember to financially support your church this past year I'm, i've been amazed though because this past year while not being very easy for a lot of christian ministries uh, we have still seen god's provision and we thank god for his provision we continue to rely on him as he works through his people and i know he will provide each and every one of our needs as a church and i believe he will provide your needs as a family as well uh, part of our responsibility is to continue giving back to him. Now, final, final uh, word on this subject. We will finally now be able to have our annual meeting. That annual meeting will happen after the service on February 28th, next Sunday. Uh, and that annual meeting is uh, to hear reports and vote to complete our new elders board. This is the meeting that had to be postponed back in January because of the pandemic and the lockdown. Uh, that meeting will take place directly after the morning service next Sunday, February 28th. And uh, well, unfortunately, contrary to regular procedure, we'll not be able to have any food at this meeting. As you well could imagine, eating and drinking together is something that we're not able to do quite yet. But let me tell you, when the opportunity uh, opens up again, we are gonna have one fantastic potluck lunch together to celebrate. But that unfortunately will not be next Sunday, February 28th. Now we will be going over all, the, all these sort of regathering details uh, next week in some of our email contacts with you. We just want everybody to be well informed and we look forward to seeing and interacting with each other again. Yeah, actually for me, I'm looking forward to meeting some of you perhaps in person for the very first time or for some, for many of you seeing you in person for the first time since way back in the summer when I preached for a call here at Chalmers or for some of you when you helped us move uh, uh, here to our home back in late November. It'll be the first time seeing you in person in that way. Now I've tried to make uh, as many contacts as, 
as, as I'm able to with through the phone and email and the encouragement devotionals and Zoom meetings and that kind of thing. But I know I haven't come close to making personal contact with every single one of you. But nothing quite, you know, no matter how you try to do it, nothing is quite the same as face to face. And so I can't wait to, to, to begin uh, strengthening those friendships with you next Sunday the 28th. If you have any questions about any of this, feel free to contact me this week. Probably the best way to contact me is at my email, bruce at chalmerschurch.com, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, now, this whole regathering for in-person services is dovetailing really nicely with the season of Lent, which we have just started. It's the season of the year for special reflection and special commitment leading up to Easter. Some of you um, celebrate the season of Lent regularly and others of you probably don't and, and, and that's okay. But Lent is not about Pancake Day, it's not about Mardi Gras, it's not about denying yourself little luxuries, even though there's nothing really inherently wrong with those things. But for those who are looking at it correctly, Lent is about practicing the presence of God. Lent is about preparing yourself for the overwhelmingly emotional experiences of the commemoration of the death and resurrection and ascension and promised return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the things that I have been encouraging you to be a part of in this Lenten season is the Journey to Easter Bible Reading Challenge. The Journey to Easter Bible Reading Challenge. We're taking uh, the challenge to read through the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reading through the Gospels in their entirety in the 40 days leading up to Easter Sunday. And the messages each Sunday until Easter will be based on something that we've read that week, in, that previous week in our devotional readings in the Gospels. And the Gospels, of course, are all centered around the life and ministry of our Savior Jesus. The Gospels are all about Christ, right? So if you haven't done so already, uh, please let me encourage you, download, print off, somehow get yourself a copy of the Journey to Easter Bible Reading Challenge reading list. Uh, you have a link to it in today's sermon link email again, and it's been sent out various forms for the last number of weeks. So hopefully uh, if you haven't already downloaded that or printed it off, you will uh, do that now. We will have some paper copies that you can pick up next Sunday, but the readings will have started by then. So if you wait until next Sunday, you'll be a few days behind. You can, you can get caught up, but I would encourage you to, to uh, be ready to start on the day that, we're, that we start. Uh, alternatively, if you want to get your, your hands on a copy of that, you can send me a quick email, uh, bruce at chalmerschurch.com, and I will send you a copy of the reading list for yourself. So what we're doing, as I've said before, is we're reading through the Gospels chronologically. That just means as the events happen. We will skip, be skipping around between the four books, going back and forth. But over the 40 days, we'll get all the way through the Gospels. We'll finish with the readings uh, of the Easter events as we uh, travel through the days of the Easter weekend. Now, the reading challenge starts this coming Wednesday. February the 24th. Mark that on your calendars. Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, the 24th, is day number one of the 40 days uh, of the uh, Bible reading challenge. This Wednesday is the 40th day before Easter Sunday. So as we anticipate the beginning of the journey to Easter 2021, really I want to kind of introduce it this morning by simply asking a question, and you'll see that on your sermon outline if you have that in front of you, and there's 14 blanks you're going to need to fill in in the next few minutes. The question is, who is this guy anyway? Who is this guy anyway? As I mentioned, you know, Lent uh, a moment ago, Lent is sort of like the Easter version of Advent. Uh, it's all about Jesus. It's all about preparing us for experiencing him again, experiencing his, his passion, experiencing his victory as we experience his death on the cross and his resurrection. And all of our readings, all of our messages over the next number of weeks are going to point to Christ. We are going to celebrate Christ. We are going to delve into his life and consider his impact. But since we're talking about Christ over the next number of Sunday mornings, we kind of first have to ask the question, who is he? Who is he? And we're going to answer that question predominantly in his own words. What he said he came to do and who he said he was. Now you may, may have heard 
I'm going to read a little essay for you. You may have heard this little essay before. It's only a couple paragraphs long. Uh, it was attributed to a preacher from the 1920s. I'm not sure the name. Uh, so it's about 100 years old now, but it's just as relevant now as it was when this unknown preacher first wrote it. And you may have heard stretches of this before, but let me read it again. This unknown preacher says this, speaking about Jesus. He is a man, or here is a man, who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city, any bigger than Jerusalem anyway. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen long centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece of the human race and leader of the column of progress. This unknown preacher says, I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. That's a good little summation of the life of Christ, even though we didn't talk about his resurrection. I like that summation. And in, in beginning to kind of delve a little bit deeper into that one solitary life, I want to take you to two uh, passages of Scripture today. I want you to have your finger in two passages, Luke chapter 4 and John chapter 10. We will be reading those passages, of course, as we go through the Bible readings uh, over the next 40 days. But uh, Luke 4 this morning and John 10. And there are other passages in your sermon outline uh, listed there for you. Uh, I want to encourage you to read those for yourself this afternoon. In fact, Lou, read uh, um, Luke 4 and John 10 over again this afternoon as well. These are a couple of passages that answer the question, again, largely in Jesus' own words, who is this guy anyway? All right? Who is Jesus? What did he come to do? Now, no doubt as we go through the next few weeks, we're going to discover many answers to those kinds of questions. Some of them are answers that we perhaps might see for the very first time. Um, others are discoveries that uh, we've made before, happy discoveries that we will make again. And uh, for us, for those happy rediscoveries, it'll be kind of like the, the verse of the hymn, I love to tell the story. Uh, one of the verses in the middle, I think, says, I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And maybe you're one of those, you've heard it all before, but to hear it again, to understand it again, and interact with it again, it's, uh, it's, it's special. And uh, I trust that you'll have some of both of those discoveries, both the new and the old, over the next 40 days. But Luke chapter 4, I want to first of all read verses 14 through 21, okay? Luke 4, 14 to 21. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. These were the glory days. Verse 16, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's pretty, pretty dramatic, isn't it? So as you look at your sermon outline that, that, that came as a link to today's message, you will see that there are an insane number of points 
Am I really preaching a 14-point sermon today, especially since we're already almost 20 minutes into it, and I haven't even used, done the first point yet? What's this guy thinking? No, don't. it's not really a 14-point sermon as it is a 14-point list. And this 14-point list, largely from the, from the mouth of Christ himself, will just begin to whet our appetites for what we're going to be reading about over the next uh, 40 days. Many of these, you know, most of these 14 points, I'm simply going to list them. And then you get to do the work of evaluating which of these things are the things that you need Jesus to do for you today. Right? I'm, I'm just listing these 14 points and you do the hard work of discerning what of these things uh, uh, you are most in need of. Okay? Well, from what I've read so far, we see that Jesus used this Old Testament teaching from Isaiah 61. And he came to, he, he used it to make the announcement, first of all, number one, that Jesus is the one who came to preach good news to the poor. There's your first blank. Jesus is the one who came to preach good news to the poor. You see, to those people who deeply feel their own poverty, and just about all of us have, you know, feel, have at one point or another at least felt our own poverty, and maybe even right now you're feeling how poor you are, and not just economically, but to those who are feeling, who are well aware of their poverty, it seems as if every bit of news is bad news, right? Every bit of news is going to be costly. Every bit of news makes it harder to survive in this cold, cruel, mad world. You know, taxes go up, gas prices go up, everything seems to be more expensive and it's harder to survive. But what Jesus says is what you will hear from me is good news. What You're, you're not going to hear bad news. You're going to hear good news, especially if you apply it to your hearts. And if, and if you live by it, and if you trust me, or on that in a moment, I've got good news for you, friends. So he's come to preach good news to the poor. That's what Isaiah said. That's what Jesus confirmed. This is about me. Number two, Jesus is the one who came to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned. He came to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned people, those in prisons. And you know, there are many kinds of prisons that people can find themselves in, and not all of those prisons are accompanied by iron bars and barbed wire, right? But Jesus proclaims freedom. He shows the way to freedom, but we have to choose that way to freedom. What he says is, you want to be free, friend? You watch what I do and you choose that freedom for yourself. He came to preach good news to the poor. He came to proclaim freedom for the imprisoned and those behind bars, those who are captive. Jesus, number three, is the one who came to heal the sick. And again, based on Isaiah 61, uh, he came to heal the sick, verse 18. And uh, <clears throat> you can see in your outline there that John chapter, I mean, Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 23 is another place to look at. Jesus is sharing some concrete proof about who he is in that passage to John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples. And you can um, read that for yourself this afternoon. But we're going to see all kinds of healings that Jesus performed. He came to number three, healed the sick. And he is still just as powerful today as he was back then. Not only to heal the sick, but number four, to raise the dead. That's part of what Jesus came to do, to raise the dead. He, he brought back to life those who had died. We're talking about Lazarus. We're talking about the widow of Nain's son. Jesus came to bring life where there was death. And probably the most incredible miracle that Jesus ever performs is the miracle in the, in the heart of someone who chooses to trust in him, to turn, to, to turn away from eternal death and find eternal life in Jesus. That itself is a miracle. He came to raise the dead. And number five, he came to release the oppressed. To release the oppressed. You may not be imprisoned, you may not be chained, you may not be sick, uh, you may not be on the verge of death, but you may be oppressed. You may need release, you may need sweet deliverance, you may need encouragement, you need that, um, that, 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 uh, uh, being re uh, that release from the oppression that you're feeling. Here the first five things already, that didn't take us long, did it? Well, continuing on from what uh, happened in that dramatic uh, service, or that dramatic reading, as Jesus read from Isaiah 61, we continue the very next verse in Luke 4, 22 through to 30. It says this. Here's where we see how the drama takes another turn. Verse 22. All spoke well of him and were amazed at, his, at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. 
Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Nahum and the, Syr Nahum and the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Well, we see from those pretty eventful few minutes some more things about what Jesus said he came to do and to be. Number six, uh, and, and um, this, this is one that he seemed to love to do. Jesus seemed to take special delight in annoying the powerful, annoying the power brokers in society, annoying the ones that thought that they had it all together and they were ruling with an iron fist. He loved to annoy the powerful, especially the powerful religious leaders who held the country captive. Even just the thought that Jesus would mention that God sanctioned the honoring of certain Gentiles, Nahum and the Syrian and the widow of Zarephath, that was enough to set them off to these smug religious leaders, Gentiles, and, and this is well stated in, uh, you know, by Jewish leaders in antiquity, that Gentiles were only created by God as fuel for the fires of hell. And to think that God gives Gentiles value, that was really annoying to them. And you see how annoying it was by what they tried to do to Jesus. But he took special delight in annoying the powerful the ones who thought they had it all together. And um, sort of related to that are the next two points. Number seven, Jesus is the one who came to convict the comfortable. Those religious leaders were very comfortable because they thought they were in control. They could lead things however they wanted. But Jesus came to convict those who were comfortable. There's a sense of this happening as well. We cannot get too comfortable. We cannot start feeling too much at home in here in this world. Whether things are going um, you know, very smoothly and we love it here, or whether things are, are rough, we need to be reminded that this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, as the old song says, right? We always have to remember that I am not home yet. So I wonder, are you a little bit too comfortable? to be used by God right now. Everything falling in line exactly the way you like and you're in control of your own world. If you are too comfortable, Jesus wants to rouse you from that. And sort of related to that is number eight. Jesus came to challenge the complacent. Sometimes when we get too comfortable, we get complacent. Complacent essentially just means we start not caring as much rest of Luke 4 then goes on from there, but to talk about complacence. He wants to rouse you, to challenge you out of your complacency, to start taking seriously the need for, uh, for being salt and light in a society that needs him. Anyway, as I say, the rest of Luke 4, Jesus drives out an evil spirit. He heals lots of people, including Peter's mother-in-law, preaches about the kingdom of God, and all throughout this series, we are going to be considering the miracles that Jesus performed, some of his parables and the teachings of Christ. We'll be witnessing some of the drama that seemed to happen all around him. But let me uh, keep on, because we, we, we need to uh, get through this. <laughs> what Jesus, Who Jesus was, what he came to do. I want to jump over to John chapter 10 and see a couple things. Again, from the lips of Christ himself, Jesus said he's the one who came to number nine, save the believing. Jesus came to save the believing. John 10, verses 7 through 9. Actually, read all of John 10. Beautiful stuff. But verses 7 through 9. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. I want to read something to you that one of my favorite New Testament commentators, William Barclay, he says in his commentary on the book of, uh, uh, of John in, in this particular passage. Barclay says this, The Jews did not understand the meaning of the story of the Good Shepherd. So Jesus openly, plainly, without concealment, took it and applied it to himself. He began by saying, I am the door, or I am the gate. 
In this parable, Jesus spoke about two kinds of sheepfolds. In the villages and towns themselves, there were communal sheepfolds where all the village flocks were sheltered when they returned home at night. These folds were protected by a strong door of which only the guardian of the door held the key. It is to that kind of fold that Jesus refers back in verses 2 and 3. But when the sheep were out on the hills in the warm season, when they did not return at night to the village at all, at night they were collected in sheep folds outside on the hillside. These hillside sheep folds were just open spaces enclosed by a wall. In them there was an opening by which the sheep came in and went out, but there was no door of any kind. What happened was that at night the shepherd himself lay down across the opening and entrance, and no sheep could get out or in except over his body. In the most literal sense, the shepherd was the door. There was no access to the sheepfold except through him. That's what Jesus was thinking of when he said, I am the door. Barclay finishes by saying, through him and through him alone, we find access to God. Jesus came to save the believing. It's through him that you can have access to God. Like Jesus himself said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He came to save the believing. Number 10, along with that, he came to give life to the trusting. The very next verse in John 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came to give life to the trusting, to those who trust in him. Some translations, when it talks about having life to the full, some translations say, and life more abundantly. Literally in Greek, it's, it's a super abundance of life. Jesus said, I came to give life and lots of it. Now, it's not all going to be easy. It's not all going to be fun, but I'm going to give you lots of life. This abundance of life may cause you to break down with all the wear and tear sometimes, but Jesus says, I've come to give you lots of life. And his promise is, is that he gives you lots of life here, and he gives you an eternal life beyond the grave. And that is something worth trusting him for. He came to give life and abundant life to the ones who trust him. Number 11, we're getting close to the end. Jesus is the one who came to protect the vulnerable. Again, the very next verse, verse 11 of John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What Jesus came to do is to protect the vulnerable ones. And maybe that's what you're feeling right now. He came uh, as well, the last three, he came, number 12, to answer the questioners, to answer those who are questioning, answer those who are asking. Jesus talked about that. Sometimes he answers a question with a question, but he promises that he is going <clears> to <throat> answer the questioners or answer those who are asking. Yeah, I'll let you look up Matthew 7, 7 to 11 for yourself this afternoon. But that includes the verse that says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus goes on to say, Your Heavenly Father loves to give good gifts to those who ask Him. Now Jesus also is the one who came. Here's the final two. Number 13, he came to wake up the sleeping. Wake up the sleeping. You can look at Ephesians 5, verses 11 to 14 for yourself later this afternoon, but the quote is there, wake up sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Christ came to wake up those who are sleeping, not just physically sleeping, but maybe you've been spiritually sleeping. Maybe you just your eyes have been closed to the needs all around you and how desperate people are who are going to an eternity without Jesus. He came to wake up the sleeping. And finally, the last point, Jesus came to stretch the faithful. That's number 14. He came to stretch the faithful, or rather he came to stretch the faith of the faithful. He stretches our faith in many ways. If you look at Luke 6, 38 or 2 Corinthians 8, verse 7, a little bit later, it, it talks about how he stretches our faith by our giving. Again, Jesus' words, Luke 6, 38, given it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The way that you give, it will be given back to you. I will preach on this someday, but I call it heavenly economics. 
doesn't make sense according to earthly economics, but heavenly economics. Do I trust him enough to give? Do I trust him enough to give generously? Do I trust him enough to give sacrificially? Right? Jesus also stretches our faith by calling us to a deeper uh, belief in him, a deeper belief in his power. He calls us beyond our comfort zone to believe in what he can do, which is way far beyond what we could ever do. I'll let you read that passage, Mark 9, for yourself later this afternoon. But it's the story of this kid who was possessed by an evil spirit. And the kid's father comes to Jesus and basically says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus is like, if you can? Do you believe I can? He says, everything is possible for him who believes. And, and the, the, the father says this, and this should be our prayer often as well. The father said, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Right? So uh, his faith was being stretched. But we should come back to that prayer often. Essentially, Lord, I believe in you. I believe in your word. I believe in your power. I believe in your ability. But doubt is always knocking at my door. God, would you overcome my unbelief as I watch you work powerfully. Overcome my unbelief as you show, show yourself to be faithful. And in that way, he stretches our faith. And what happens when our faith stretches? It gets bigger, right? So I'm wondering, final point, final question there you see at the bottom of your sermon outline. Which of these things do you need most from Jesus today? Are you poor in needing of good news? Are you imprisoned and needing his freedom? Are you sick and lifeless and oppressed and needing his healing hand upon your life? Are, are you maybe the other, the other side of the coin? Are you feeling powerful? Are you feeling comfortable? Are you, is that then turning to complacency? And are you needing his conviction and his challenge at work in your life? Evaluate yourself honestly in that way. Are you trusting and believing in him, but you want to feel his life and his salvation filling you up even more from the inside out? Are you feeling vulnerable and in need of his protection? Are you questioning or asking him things and searching for his answers? Are you sleeping and you need him to wake you up and get you back into productive service for him instead of, of simply resting on your laurels? Are you attempting to be faithful, but your faith is being stretched? Maybe you think it's being stretched right to the breaking point. Let me encourage you to take some evaluation time. Read all of these passages over again, sometime very soon, even this afternoon if you can. See if any of these things describe where you are at or what you most need right now. Jesus Christ came to reach out and provide the remedy for all of these situations. Wherever you are at, Jesus Christ is there. He will meet you there and he'll take you to a good place. If Christ is all that, if he came to do all of those things, then we can have courage, we can have hope, we can have motivation to keep on keeping on. We can have motivation to keep on trusting him, keep on resting in him, keep on serving him, not only throughout this Lent and Easter season, but beyond into the rest of the spring and summer and fall into the next year's months, days, however long the Lord gives us on this planet. We are going to re read and study more about him in the next few weeks, and I hope that you will be with us for this great adventure. Remember, the readings start on Wednesday, February the 24th, this coming Wednesday. But we just need to wrap this up right now. I need to pray, and we need to uh, be on our way to the rest of the day. Can you just bow your heads with me, folks, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we stand on the edge of this journey into the Gospels, and we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the ways that we can be encouraged, the ways we can be challenged, the ways we can be cajoled, the ways we can be motivated by your word. We want to thank you, Jesus, that you have the power to meet us exactly where we are at. You can provide us the freedom. You can provide the release, the protection that we need every single moment, and we thank you for that. Thank you that we can see so many things about what you came to do, Jesus, even from your own lips. May your name be praised as you work in us by your Holy Spirit. This we pray in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Chalmers family. I want to encourage you to stay tuned for more information uh, and communications about our regathering as a church family next Sunday morning. Plan to be with us if you can. One way or another, in person or online, we will see you again. So let my, my encouragement is right now that you would go with the blessing and the protection and the peace of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on us 
and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Have a good week, friends. God bless you, and we'll see you soon.